I would say, um, know your lines. That's very important. Um, yeah. And uh, I was waiting for someone to say that. Yeah, know your, <laughs> said, yeah. Show first up on time or yeah. know your lines. What first and foremost, <laughs> memorize your lines. <laughs>Welcome to the SAG After Foundations, the business program. I am Audrey Cleo Yap. And if you're interested in programming from the SAG After Foundation, please subscribe and like this video. Now, it is my pleasure to welcome our panel of Emmy nominated directors. Hello, panel. Hello, everyone. I'm so excited that you're here. Uh, <laughs> hi. Hi, and congratulations. <laughs> You're all already winners in my book. Um, this is such a, a standout panel. And, you know, we really like to focus on the performers and the craft and, and your interactions with your actors. And you got, you've gotten to work with some amazing casts on your show. Um, so I'm curious, my first question to everyone is, how did working with the actors on your particular show actually stretch you as a director. Um, and I wanna start with Shireen, especially because of the episode, The Boy From 6B, which uh, focuses almost entirely uh, on, on a deaf character. Yeah, well, I mean, it's, it's a great question. Um, you know, there were things that I hadn't quite taken into account that would be really challenging for the actors. I mean, first of all, you know, we had two actors who learned ASL, Nathan Lane being one of them, and, you know, they, they did incre incredible work. Um, but, you know, one of the things that I became aware of while we were shooting, and it's just something that, you know, you kind of take for granted, um, I think, as a director and a performer until you arrive, at, you know, you find yourself in this situation. But essentially, we had a scene where Nathan Lane needed to enter his apartment carrying a stack of mail, wearing gloves, wearing a coat. And he had a lot of business he needed to do with his hands. He needed to put the mail down, take off his gloves, take off his coat, pick up an envelope, put jewels in an urn. And you, you, know, you take all these things for granted that an actor is going to do them. And then you remember, oh, he's got a sign while he's doing all of this. Um, and it's not even, you know, not even really, I think Nathan was even surprised when he got to set and was like, oh, oh my gosh, there's so much to do in this scene. And I'm just realizing now all of the activity and I have to be signing and I have to be looking at the other actor when he's signing to me because I can't, you know, I can't turn away and do all of this other business that I need to be doing. I have to be looking at him so that I'm seeing what he's saying to me. And it was just like a whole new level of, um, of choreography and, and level of detail that like, you know, again, you just kind of take these things for granted. Um, and it was just kind of a level of detail that like Nathan really needed to kind of get into his body. Like this, you know, when exactly he was gonna sign, when he was gonna take off the gloves, then he was gonna sign again, then he was gonna take off the coat and watching it, it feels so natural. And again, he did like such an incredible job. But it was really interesting to arrive on set and realize that this was uh, kind of another layer of, of detail and physicality that needed to be incorporated into the scene and that I had to kind of navigate with the actors. Yeah, it sounds like a unique challenge uh, for sure. Uh, I want to throw it over to Michael and Francesca with the dropout. You have a wealth of material to work from, <laughs> from cold from the Theranos story, news, news clippings, articles, podcasts, what what have you. So how did how did having that wealth of material stretch you all as as directors and showrunners? Uh, yeah, Michael. Wow. Um, hmm. I mean, I was a fan of well, a fan isn't quite the right word. I was myself obsessed with the story way before I was involved in the project. Um, and so I had been uh, listening to the podcast, watched the documentary, read the book, um, had been a kind of observer of Elizabeth Holmes prior to all of the sort of scandal about it all coming out. And I found her fascinating, just like the rest of the world did. Um, and so I think for me, 
there was this excitement around recreating the story almost for myself to, to try to, to try to maybe understand what had happened. I think I speaking personally, I'm sort of fascinated by how do you, how do you, how does one like stay in the center of a, of a storm like that? Um, mm -hmm. And I feel like in a lot of ways, this, the show sort of tries to explain that. And so for me, it was mm -hmm. just kind of like an opportunity to get inside this story that I was really fascinated by. What do you think, Francesca? I think what you think, Michael. <laughs> I, do. I was fascinated as well. And as soon as I actually saw the article, I called my agents and I'm like, track this sucker down. <laughs> I want to do this. Um, and then I was, you know, fortunate enough to, to get hired for, for the gig. I mean, I think when you're working with, a, you know, the caliber of talent that is Amanda Seyfried and William H. Macy and, you know, and a lot of them, it's, you know, it's, it's really, you know, you're obviously holding space for them and working with them, but it's also, you're just watching sort of, you know, like people at the top of their game just sort of, you know, deliver. And really it's about sort of, you know, how to maximize their performance, you know, and I'm kind of a closet DP. So I really like to sort of do the dance with them and like, how am I going to capture, you know, the essence of the scene and what's really going down in the most seamless way that sort of like brings you inside with them, you know? So, um, you know, that's that's sort of what I attempted to do, you know, with Jonathan Vermansky, who's who is the actual DP. <laughs> <laughs> um, Karin, I want to throw it to you because Yellow Jackets is this super interesting show that is like half period piece as it takes place in the 90s and then you also got to work with these actresses who really made their careers and and came up during the 90s so working mm -hmm. with them and then working with who, who played their younger counterparts I'm curious about how uh how that stretched you as a director yeah, it, it, it was uh, a fascinating experience, actually, because the young cast were all across the board, wonderful actors, so fresh and different from one another. And then of our present day cast, uh, you know, three of them, Juliet, Christina and Melanie, were themselves child actors of the 90s. And, and so in some respects, what they brought, I think, was honestly the wounds of that time and and all that we still have to learn about how we relate to young women um they brought that perspective on honestly the the damage of being seen as female and what what kinds of stuff can happen what kinds of um trauma comes out of that experience and so in a weird way it created this thread between the young cast and and the present day cast that somehow felt very organic uh because it was so much about the notion that being being female is its own kind of trauma from the gate and and so i i was i was really interested by the ways the the performances spoke to each other uh, but particularly by how Melanie and Christina and Tawny and and um, uh, how everyone brought and Juliet brought their past with them into the into the performances. And were those discussions that you were having with them as as you were shooting the pilot? It's so weird. We didn't quite realize when we were casting it that particularly Juliet, Melanie and Christina were icons of that time. And so it was very odd to have them all on set at certain points and, and have it land on us that that happened and that they were going to bring that experience and that visibility to, you know, to the process. And, and, you know, we had wonderful other actors as well. And, and somebody like Tawny Cypress, who's been working for a really long time. It's like, she, she's able to just show the world what what she's capable of which is so much and so it was it was a really exciting it was a really exciting foray into the mind and the soul and the creativity of a middle-aged woman and it's a pretty exciting place to be i got to say yeah 
Director Wong, uh, you got to work with a range of actors, some who were veterans in Korean cinema, uh, and then you have newcomer, a newcomer like Ho Yeon. This is her first acting role ever. So how did working with, with these actors stretch you? Oh. 뭐 사실 그 일남 역을 한 오영수 선배님부터 평생을 연기하신 호연처럼 진짜 한 번도 연기를 해본 적이 없는 그 액터들이 다 저희 오스킬 게임 안에 포함이 되어 있었는데요. 글쎄요, 뭐어뭐 뭐 베테랑 액터인 JJ 리나 오영수 선생님 같은 경우는 말할 필요도 없지만 사실 음뭐 신인 액터인 호연 같은 경우도 어, 저는 뭐 경험은 부족하지만 뭐 충분히 오디션부터 시작해서 그 녀가 어떤 연기를 할수 있는지를 봐왔기 때문에 뭐 신인이라고 해서 뭐 특별히 제가 다르게 다른 그 배우분들하고 다르게 뭐 대하거나 하지는 않았어요. 다만 혹시 그녀가 이제 처음 겪는 세트에서 모든 그 경험들이 초반에는 너무 좀 그녀의 어떤 연기나 이런 것들에 그 너무 낯설어서 어떤 얻을 수, 가질 수 있는 공포감이나 두려움 같은 것들을 없애주기 위해서 최대한 좀 편하게 해주려고 호연 씨를 좀 편하게 해주려고 노력을 했고 뭐 저뿐만이 아니라 그뭐 다른 모든 배우분들이 호연 씨한테 그 어떤 좀 집같이 편안한 그런 그녀의 모델 런웨이 같이 편안한 익숙한 환경을 좀 제공해 주려고 초반에는 많이 노력들을 했던 것 같습니다. So Lucia and Mary Lou, we need to hear from you. Uh, you both work on shows that are in the comedy realm uh, and, and you all are no strangers to comedy, but how did working on these specific shows, how have they stretched you as directors and showrunners? Lucia, why don't you go? Oh, okay, sure. Thank you, Mary Lou. I love Mary Lou. Um, <laughs> so, you know, Hacks, you know, is a uh, is a show that, you know, I, I started out myself as a performer and, you know, the show, the ethos of it really is just, you know, this is a woman who a performer who's been working hard her whole life. Her, she's kind of been overlooked. She keeps getting knocked down and she keeps getting back up. And, and, you know, for us, I think, you know, that, that story and that grit is, is something that we really feel like is the story we want to tell um, of the kind of people that, you know, want to tell their stories. And, and I think that that, you know, for us, like, not only that, but we also love being able to showcase, you know, actors who haven't necessarily gotten their due as well. And, you know, I think that's why we had such success with, you know, writing guest characters that have really been beloved, you know, is because we love writing for, for these kinds of people who haven't necessarily get, gotten a chance to stretch their abilities comedically or dramatically. And so for us, whether it is the writing or the directing, uh, the big, you know, it's, it's so exciting to say like, how far can we stretch these characters? And then we get so excited about the idea of writing for certain actors or people that we also discover. So, so for us, um, honestly, the story of Deborah and, and the story of, of these performers is, is, you know, I think something that we love doing that really stretches us as, as, as creators. Um, and, you know, our mission is really to, to be able to celebrate performers in, in every way. And so for us, the show is, have been like a mission, but it's also been such an exciting calling for us in, in, in every way to, to kind of just like be invigorated by, by so much of the potential that, that is out there. Mary Lou, over to you, our sitcom vet. <laughs> yeah, sitcom. Well, it's so interesting because, um, you know, we said in terms of you asking us how this stretched us, you know, when you go away from something for so long, which I did for almost 10 years, um, I, you know, I went into the episodic world and I think when my agents heard people saying, oh, that action director who likes to blow shit up, <laughs> I basically went, oh, I can go back to comedy again because, you know, I'm going to be okay in terms of my, my um, standing as, a, as an episodic director. But um, as uh, Shireen said earlier, you know, the thing I love most about being a director is that you get to stretch and learn things every day. And, you know, for me, it was like going back and going and realizing, yeah, I know a lot of this. I know how to shoot it. But but re realizing I was coming back with a new set of tools and learning how to play again, because, you know, there's days of rehearsal before a camera even appears on the soundstage and, and, and having that sort of environment 
And like Director Huang, I also found, you know, I had a newcomer in terms of a comedian who had not acted much. Now, I was lucky in the fact that Debbie Allen had directed the pilot and had surrounded this natural actor, but of course she didn't know it yet, um, with a unbelievably talented supporting cast. And as long as I gave them the, um, the playground to you know, explore and bring their own creativity, um, it was a it was a great environment to for her to find her center, and start believing in her center as a as an actor. Um, so many of the others, you know, believe it or not, the youngest one possibly having more years on television than you know some of the older, more seasoned actors. But it was amazing to see and and be part of that playtime um, and that time of discovery and to just fall into that. Um, it was, it was, a, it was a, a blessing. It looks, it looks like a lot of fun as well. <laughs> it's out there. <laughs> <laughs> They're not kidding um, when they say grown ass comedy. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> The whole new genre. I wanted to give a shout out to uh, Cameron uh, Mi Young Kim, who is also a first time actor who played Erica Chung. And um, and that was it was so exciting to work with her because I love working with like first time actors um, just to to watch them step into their power. And um, is just such a, it's such a rush. <laughs> like, and it really just, it makes me so happy. And it's like, um, and they, I think it's, they feed off that. They see that I'm like blowing up behind the camera and then they're just, you know, really going for it. And um, she was just amazing. And, um, you know, and she auditioned, uh, you know, because of the whole COVID thing, you know, through Zoom and, you um, like we didn't realize that she, you know, she was a disabled person. And it was amazing because she just was, you know, she was so incredible in this role. And and it was just like, I don't know, I just really wanted to give a shout out to her. I thought she did an amazing, amazing job. Well, awesome. Well, my next question uh, is directed to Director Wong, Michael, and Karen specifically, but I do want anyone to just jump in. But, um, you know, for those of you who have worked both in film and television, is there a difference in how you direct actors, you know, in, in each medium? Um, Director Wong, let's start with you. So, Squid Game is my first series. Very 시리즈보다는 티, 그 필름 쪽에서 일을 더 많이 했던 JJ 리도 그렇고 그런 배우들이었어서 어, 뭐 특별하게 제가 음, 시리즈를 하면서 뭔가 다른 자세를 취했던 건 아닌 것 같고요. 그 배우들을 대할 때나 어, 디렉팅을 할 때나 다만 이게 워낙에 이제 어, 긴 작품이고 영화에 비해서 길이가 어, 중간에 이제 어쨌든 에피소드가 나눠지는 작품이었기 때문에 좀그 마지막 항상 그 저희끼리 이제 에피소드의 끝을 어떻게 클리프행어를 통해서 다음 장면을 보게 할 것인가에 대한 그런 이야기들을 배우들하고 저도 처음 해보는 경험이었어서 그런 부분의 연구들을 좀 많이 하고 배우들한테 이제 어떤 부분에서 어떻게 끝낼 것인가에 대한 설명들을 좀 많이 했던 것 같아요. 그게 저한테는 가장 처음 해보는 경험이었던 것 같습니다. I love that collaboration. Um, Karen and Michael, I. It, it, how what's the difference for you if there is a difference if you're directing actors on a series versus a film i mean to me obviously the storytelling approach i think has to be fundamentally the same it's it's all storytelling i do think with television there's a there's just a faster clip in terms of your production schedule and your days and so in some respects 
what I love about TV is that it demands this very direct and very forthright and candid relationship with actors in which I want to check in with them. I want to be really present with them right away. I want them to see that that's where I'm going to meet them. And I hope that then, you know, I can meet them where they are. And um, it, it, in a funny way, I think it could appear that there's less time for exploration, but there's also this more intense faster connection in some ways because the the medium demands it the workflow demands it I, I don't I don't know Michael do you feel the same or what what is what's your experience with it your question is 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 it different with the medium for me it's like the actors are for me it's an actor question more so than a medium question like different actors are different to deal with so like I find that like comedic actors are different than um, your, your, your method actors or your super, you know, so it's really, for me, it's a case by case. Each actor has their own way they like to work. And I tend to try to figure that out a little bit. Like I try to kind of get a sense of, of who my, who I'm dealing with and how they want to be directed or what that collaboration is like for them. And then how I can like sort of give them the right kind of uh, work with them in the right way. So for me, it's less about the medium and more about the individual actor. And, and speaking of that collaboration and that interaction with your with your actors and cast, um, I, I'm wondering in each of your respective shows, was there a scene that you can recall that was just a tough nut to crack, that you just weren't getting what you needed in those first couple of takes and kind of walk us through how you got there with your actor or actors. Shereen, let's start with you. I knew you were going to start with me again. Um, <laughs> no. I'm just going by the, by the boxes on the screen. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, the, it's interesting because from a visual point of view, it's like, oh, you know, the funeral parlor sequence was really challenging to shoot because we were in such a small space and I had, you know, three characters, two of whom were hiding from, you know, one character and I had to kind of create this kind of like goose chase within this really small space. So that kind of, that sequence comes to mind because um, I, I, I just wanted it to feel really grounded and believable that these two people could really be hiding from, you know, our deaf character and, and, and so that it didn't sort of feel like, oh, you know, there's no way like he would have, he would have seen them by now. Um, so that was kind of an interesting uh, challenge, but I, I would say, you know, we did the opening scene of the episode is a young Theo, you know, Theo's our deaf character in this episode. And so we cast a younger version of Theo and he was uh, a non-actor, a, a very young um, deaf non-actor who um, really just had never been on a set. I mean, was just really had like, was super, super green. Um, and it was really interesting to, um, and, and challenging to kind of communicate with him and try to get like what we needed from the scene. Um, and, you know, I, I kind of had to do things like I, I've never really had to do before because, you know, you're working with a child, but you're working with a deaf child and the kid's parents are right there. And, you know, every time he did something, he would kind of look at me to see if there was like approval or not. And so it was just a really interesting um, challenging moment where there were a number of takes and, and we weren't quite getting it. And finally, it was just really, it was about, I mean, the thing is what Karen said is exactly right. Like in TV, you're moving so quickly and there's no time often, like, especially when you're an episodic director, you're coming in to direct an episode and, and often, you know, unlike film where you are doing everything like in TV, when you come in as an episodic director, very often the actors know more than you do. They own their characters. They know more about their characters. So in some way, it's almost easier sometimes in TV. There's a little bit less to do sometimes in TV as an episodic director. So not, of course, not when you're doing the pilot or anything like that. But um, in this instance, uh, I what I realized was that I didn't have time. I hadn't had time to really spend with this child. He was, you know, like a 10-year-old or 9-year-old kid and he was kind of terrified in this environment and didn't really know what was going on. And so it was one of those instances where you just have to slow everything down and like to get what you need, even though there's all this pressure to move on and move on, 
it pays so much to just slow everything down, take off all the pressure, take a moment to just bond with someone and make them feel really safe and then go back to the scene. And ultimately that that's kind of what paid off. Karen, is that a technique that you have, uh, you've used <laughs> in the past or while you're directing to get through those tougher scenes to crack with actors? I mean, honestly, in this particular show and for this pilot, one of the most incredibly challenging scenes of the show was the opening, the opening scene in which we're watching a girl run barefoot through the wilderness in the snow for her life, we understand, but, but we're watching a stunt performer do that. And yet it's imperative that we get a performance and feel feel a, a sense of terror and feel a sense of you know real dread and danger in what we're what we're watching and so it was really interesting to be able to kind of cross that boundary um, in which I think we think of stunt performers as um, stunt performers only but of course they're they're fully performing the the reality that they're living with their body and in this case it's a very intense reality and so it was it was great to actually speak to this really really talented stunt performer and and find you know common ground in terms of the way she was breathing the way she was running the way she was stumbling that all of those things were the performance and um we were doing that in freezing cold five feet of snow in mammoth so it was a little bit that was the challenge was having those conversations in a real place that was as physically challenging as it actually looked and speaking of physically challenging uh michael and francesca i mean that dance scene with amanda will go down <laughs> in history uh but i imagine that probably wasn't the toughest scene for all of you to to crack I mean, uh, well, no, that was probably one of the funnest scenes ever <laughs> uh, to direct. Um, but I think, I mean, in this, you know, on this particular show, there there weren't so much sort of like acting challenges because, like I said, it was really, uh, you know, everyone was pretty much at the top of their game. I would say, you know, maybe the the party sequences, like whenever there's like, and here's your like fifty extras. <laughs> all have to kind of coordinate and, you know, and not look into your camera and not like bump into the camera and, you know, all those kind of, you know, choreographed things with like so many people plus, you know, you, you know, you only have like, you know, four hours in the house and the sun's coming up and, you know, it was more <laughs> uh, those usual kind of, you know, uh, challenges that we all have, especially in TV because, like Karen rightfully said, it's like you're really, you know, running for your life, but it, it does give an intensity to things because, you know, you do really need to connect to everyone like kind of instantly and sort of, you know, have an instant trust like, okay, I have your back, you have mine and let's just run, <laughs> run for our lives. Um, yeah. <laughs> for, for me, there was a there's a you know there's this, a big argument scene in, in green juice which is the episode um that ever that that i'm here for um and um i think there was a big discovery for me with the actors which had to do with how elizabeth's character re, um, relates to um naveen's character sunny and the way she talks to him and um there, there's a level of of contempt that she has towards him. They have this very strange relationship. And I think that it was a, disc there, there was a moment where we probably rehearsed it a bunch of times as just sort of your typical argument scene, kind of two characters screaming at each other, but it just wasn't feeling meaningful. And, and there was a sort of a discovery of, of, of finding levels to it that are really bizarre that have to do with their, with this very unique, dynamic that, that those two characters have. And so when I think about the challenging scenes, it was a lot of the kind of like scenes between Naveen and, uh, and, and Amanda where they were kind of 
the tete-a-tete scenes between them where they're, where they're very unique dynamics as a couple were a riddle for us to solve. And then how do you work with the actors then to massage that and get ultimately what you want out of it? Or, you know, or do you rely on Naveen and Amanda to sort of have a dialogue among themselves and, and work that out? I mean, for, for me, there, there's, you know, some trust there. So there's some, you know, you hope to get a, a level of trust with them to where you're, you're, you're working together and you're going, do we got it? Do we got it? And they want to know, they want to ask you, do you think we got it? And then they want to trust that if you say yes, that you did. Um, and so I think with them, with Naveen and Amanda, kind of, kind of we were all there in the beginning before the char- their characters really even existed fully. And so there's a sort of an evolutionary process. And so you kind of hope that, I think there's this moment where you all kind of look at each other and you go, yeah, that, that was it, that felt, that felt good. And you kind of hope that you get to that moment before the AD or the line producers tells you, you have to move on. <laughs> um, and, and if you don't, then you beg for a little more time to get it, you know, but um, that's kind of what it was for us. And I'm sure that on a certain level, I'm sure that, that the actors have that, that communication between themselves as well. Yeah. Director Wong, uh, let's hear from you. Any scenes that were particularly tough to crack with your actors and, and how you worked through that? Physically, <laughs> 그 시즌 에피소드 2에 그 게임장에서 다들 풀려 나와서 돌아오는 장면이 있는데 그 중에서 그 JJ 리와 호연이 그 승합차에서 버려져서 길바닥에 버려져서 거기서 이제 옷을 입고 서로 풀어주고 근데 호연이가 정재 씨를 JJ 리를 풀어주지 않고 있다가 마지막 마지막에 풀어주는 장면이 있어요. 그 그걸 해가 뜨기 직전에 찍었는데. 해가 되게 빠르게 뜨고 있어서 그, 그 해가 완전히 뜨기 전에 그 장면을 한 두, 두 시간인가 세 시간밖에 없는 사이에 그 장면을 찍었어야 되는데 그 호연이가 그게 두 번째 촬영인가 그랬어요. 그 너무 긴장을 한 상태여서 이 친구가 시간이 없다는 걸 알고는 더 목소리가 작아지고 더 떠는 걸 느껴가지고 어. 진짜 그때는 또 근데 뭐 해가 뜨면은 다시 이걸 찍을 수가 없다는 걸 저희들이 알았기 때문에 일정이나 예상상에 다들 너무 서두르고 있었고 호연이를 그렇게 그 신인 배우를 배려해 줄 시간이 제가 거의 없었어요. 그래서 어 그렇다고 너무 몰아붙이면 이 친구가 더 긴장을 할것 같아서 이 친구의 목소리가 너무 너무 작게 나오는데 그냥 어느 순간에는 표정만 보고 결정을 오케이를 했습니다. 그러니까 그 친구의 표정만 괜찮으면 목소리가 좀 작아도 나중에 ADR에서 다할수 있다고 생각을 해서 어, 그때는 호연이한테 별 얘기를 안 하고 어, 그녀의 목소리나 이런 것들은 굉장히 아, 너무 작아서 어려운 상태인데 불구하고 그냥 표정만 오케이면 너무 좋았어 계속 뭐 perfect good 하면서 넘어가서 <웃음> 그 장면을 정말 가까스로 해가 뜨기 직전에 끝냈던 기억이 있습니다. 와우. Wow. That's a teamwork makes the dream work, right? <laughs> uh, Lucia and Mary Lou would love to hear from the two of you. Mary Lou, you go first on this one. Well, um, for me, there's um, there's vignettes in this in this um, episode, and one of them I had to pre-shoot because it was basically on a, an homage to an existing movie that Denzel Washington plays, the titular character of the Equalizer. It's the same um, a movie that. Queen Latifah's present day um, series is based on. And coordinating um, the work of, again, a stunt performer, and I call them performers because I actually worked with this one where she was playing, um, she would doubled a character on another series, a big episodic superhero thing I had done. So I knew how great she was, but the way they both work together to match each other's um, actions in, in not just a, a physical way, but in, a, in an organic way, because it, it's basically a character who annihilates another character because he's been so heinous 
that he deserves to be destroyed. Um, and to see the two of them work together as performer and stunt double was really uh, challenging, but amazing. And in my final cut, I have to say two thirds of it, even more, probably 75 to 80% of it is my actress, Brianna, Brianna Guadalupe, um, who plays one of the daughters um, because she just rose to the occasion and really shadowed this stunt double so much that they were each other's, you know, it was seamless in terms of who was doing what. Um, so it was challenging, but at the same time, you know, I think we've all said that when there's those victories on set, the, you know, the actors feel good because they know they've got it, but the victory for us is so amazing. Like, yes. Um, yeah. And, and for, for me, um, you know, the episode, the first episode of, of the second season, um, there will be blood, you know, we had about the second, most mostly the second half of the episode takes place at this arena and there's this really big, you know, it's fight night. And so we have a lot of different scenes where characters are interacting, but we also have this really big fight scene. And, and basically the whole thing had to be shot in two days. All the fight choreography, all, all the scenes, like I think we did like 60 something setups per day. I mean, like just like so, so, so fast um, and including, you know, all the action stuff. So it was like, just like truly like set up, a, do a setup and get it once. Don't even cut, just reset and do it again and then move on. I mean, it was truly like one of those 24 hour film festivals. It just was, <laughs> job. Um, so in some ways it was in also not to get into the nitty gritty, but we also had so much like background. Not only did we have to just deal with them, you know, crossing stuff, but we also had to do a lot of tiling of backgrounds to make the whole stadium be full. So we'd have a lot of just like, moving background from here to here to here to, to comp it all together later. So on a technical level, it was just incredibly difficult just to make the day um, or the days. Um, and I give so much credit to not only the background art actors because they just were like on it, like every time we needed them to react in a certain way, they just were, every, the hive mind was like off the chain. Um, but when it comes to the actual scene work, um, there was a scene where Gene Smart's character, Deborah Vance, is um, interacting kind of a on again, off again guy, Marty, who owns a casino where she had previously had her residency and she meets his new girlfriend who she assumes is gonna be an another 25 year old, but is actually an age appropriate woman. And she is shocked by this, she's speechless. Um, and, you know, Jean and I, obviously we've been working together for, for a couple of seasons now. And, you know, she's so dedicated to the script and she's so committed to like every piece of action. And she's like, and we're almost like 99.9% .9 of the time, we don't really even have to talk about the scenes ahead of time. But it was kind of interesting um, that the, in that scene, her initial instinct was to almost be, um, sad her initial instinct was to be sad to see this woman to kind of show show it in her reaction um which wasn't really the intention when we wrote it it was more a little bit more of a comedic take which is just like shell shocked has no words and then mayor joe has to play by the fantastic lauren weedman another actor who we love writing for um you know sweeps in and says oh, would you excuse us and and takes takes him away from it so it was really interesting in the middle of this really kind of manic crazy crazy day where we just had to move it, it was another instance that i think that shreen was kind of saying you have to actually stop and and say all right well let's actually talk talk through this motivation and talk through the character and, and you know gene is just the best <laughs> and so you know like is is able to just say stop and have this honest communication about you know here's why we were thinking this and she's like well here's how i i read it and and you know, it was a really egoless interaction where it was like, okay, let's try it this way. And then let's try it that way. And then after we tried it, the more, you know, slightly more comedic way of her just being like mouth agape and just staring, you know, at, after she tried that take, she was like, that felt really good. And so it was an instance where like, we were able to like work on it together and, um, you know, figure, get it to a place where then also when they did the exit and the turnaround, you know, she was, she threw in a couple alts and, and had a couple different, you know, buttons to the scene. And, 
And that's just something where I can, I love walking away from the day where I'm like, you know, we, we found it together. And, you know, like she also added stuff to it that wasn't on the page that also, you know, elevated the whole thing. And, and like, I, I know I'm a broken record, but like coming from being a performer, like that's like absolutely my favorite thing is being able to collaborate with actors to get to the, the scene to a place where I didn't even know it was going to go. They didn't know it was going to go and it ended up better than both of us even kind of imagined. And like, truly, like, of course, I, it's so exciting when, you know, people then see the final cut and like, we're like, that's great. But like, I can actually just go to sleep that night and be like, have all the satisfaction I need because like, I feel like, you know, we did it together. Um, and thinking about it more, I, I, I would be remiss not to mention what was probably the most challenging uh, part of the episode, which is, you know, the episode is partly told from the experience, um, from, from the point of view of a deaf character, but the other part of it um, is our hearing characters are, you know, the trio played by um, Steve Martin, Martin Short, and Selena Gomez, who are also being silent. And that was a massive challenge, like really grounding their silence. Like, you know, and, I, and I especially, I think the sequence that was probably the most challenging uh, to figure out with the actors was the, um, the date between Amy Ryan and uh, Steve Martin. And it was, it was really interesting because we went into it and to begin with, when they were, when they were doing the, the, the scenes, it's kind of a number of little scenes. And the, the showrunner was kind of like, well, you know, I think that what will ground this, because I was asking a lot of questions about the silence and why the silence and wh what is, you know, what is the, the purpose of the silence in this first date? Um, and the response was really, well, these are the kind of awkward silences in between the dialogue. So what we want to do is really find the awkward silence in those like, you know, between the, the dialogue that we're not hearing on screen. And it was a really interesting challenge because, you know, when we first started doing it, the silence felt, you know, sometimes a little contrived, like not really super grounded. And it, what I discovered with the actors was that we kind of needed to really improv. We, we needed to find, you know, the dialogue that led to the awkward silence um, in, in certain, you know, moments of those scenes. And, and I also needed to give the actors permission in at least one take to speak. And what I found was when that happened, um, there were a lot of really amazing vocalizations that happened. So even though there might have not been, they might have not actually said anything, maybe they laughed or maybe they grunted or maybe there was just a sound that actually made everything feel that much more natural and that much more awkward. And so it kind of sold the moment. And so we kind of went from, you know, the first few takes feeling like, ooh, you know, I'm not sure that this is feeling as real and grounded as we wanted to, to then really getting to the point through kind of some improv and sort of, you know, allowing them at least one take where they could speak, where it was like, ooh, okay, that's great. Like we found something that felt really organic. So it was really fun to kind of be able to, you know, collaborate with them in that process. I'm glad that you shared that uh, with us. Um, that's such a great anecdote. Um, we are running up on time, but because we have this fantastic panel and I love that all of you mentioned working with such a range of actors from absolute newcomers to ones who really maybe haven't gotten their shine and you wanted to shed a little bit more light of them. And some of you have been performers yourself. So I want to know what is the one piece of advice you can impart on our audience that makes your job as a director easier? And Mary Lou, we're gonna start with you, if that's okay. Um, uh, yes, no problem. Um, I would say, cause I came from, you know, equity and SAG were my first two unions. I would say, trust your instincts and go with them. Because once I see what the inner life is that you're bringing, then I can always mold that. Um, but for you to be up in your head and second guessing, you know, doesn't make for an organic nor authentic performance. But when you come from what's really coming from your heart and from, you know, what you're feeling, then I can move on from there. So always trust your gut. Lucia, what are, what are your words of advice? It, it's in a similar vein, but, but I think it's like a little bit, don't, don't hold back entirely. I, it, it is, there's something about like, you know, make me, do the thing that you want in the cut, you know, because it is like, 
if you make me look good, I'm going to make you look good. You know what I mean? Like give it, give it like your absolute, like the, the version of it. If you were directing what you would do. And then I'm on all likelihood, probably going to want to use that version of it, you know? And I think that that's, that's the thing is sometimes people, again, it's kind of what like Mary Lou, Mary Lou is saying, but like, I think people, sometimes actors might come on thinking I have to do what makes the director happy, but I'm like, no, do the choice that makes you happy. Cause I want to make sure we get that. And there's a reason that you think it's good. It's probably because it's showing your range of ability. And, and I, I want to be able to do that as much as you want to show it. And director Wong, over to you. So, um... 감독을 믿으라고 말해주고 싶어요. 어, 어떤 경우에 액터들은 어, 현장에서 이제 감독에 대한 신뢰를 못 갖는 순간 자꾸 스스로가 자신을 보려고 하고 자기가 뭘 잘했는지 잘못했는지를 스스로 찾으려고 하는데 그럴수록 생각이 많아지면서 오히려 그 퍼포먼스가 안 좋아지는 경우를 많이 봤어요. 그래서 최대한 자신을 캐스팅하고 자신에게 어, 그 어떤 그 디렉션을 주고 어, 좋은 것과 나, 좋지 않은 것을 얘기해 주는 감독의 그 디렉터를 디렉션을 믿으라 그와의 신뢰 관계를 구축하라 그러면 오히려 더 편하게 자신의 안에 있는 걸 자연스럽게 끄집어내는 그런 연기를 할수 있지 않을까 생각을 합니다. 그래서 감독을 믿으라고 말해주고 싶습니다. Love that, Francesca and Michael. Let's hear from you. Well, it seems like trust is is uh, <laughs> is the word of the hour, and I and I and I I think that that's absolutely right. Both in trusting themselves and the director, and you know, and I think you know, in TV, there's so little time sometimes to really, you know, have that time to bond. So, like, I guess try to find those moments. I know that I do try to find those moments to bond with my actors. Um, you know, whether it's in line to go to the loo or like, you know, what, what a craft <laughs> service, but it's like, just, you know, it's, we're all humans. We're all just trying to do the best that we possibly can. We all have the same, you know, goal in mind and also to just go for it because, you know, this isn't theater, meaning like we have different takes we can use. So don't, you know, don't hold back. Like if there's something that you want to try, just you know try it because this it, now's the time like while we've got this set up and you're here and i'm here and um you know and just yeah and just go for it because you know what else are we here to do other than to just like you know shoot for the rafters i would say um know your lines that's very important <laughs> um yeah and uh I was waiting for someone to say that. Yeah, know your, <laughs> said, yeah. Show first up on time or yeah. know your lines. What first and foremost, <laughs> memorize your lines. Um, and uh, I mean, you know, I was an actor or whatever you, whatever I would be called. Okay, um, Michael, you're a very good actor. Oh, though. thank you very much. But, you know, I really appreciate that. Um, I'm available uh, if you want to cast me in the show. I'm available. Um, I'm enough. offer only. I'm offer only though. I but, wouldn't expect anything less. Um, scale plus <laughs> season. Scale season plus two of Squid Game. Season two of scale, Squid Game. Let's just scale get plus you on. ten. Scale plus ten. Um, but uh, I was so terrified of messing up. I was so terrified of getting of messing up my lines, of forgetting my lines, of not doing what what the director wanted me to do. A lot of this was in auditions more than anything. And usually I never got past the audition phase. And people would always say to me, they want you to succeed. They want you to succeed, like relax. They want you to do well. And I didn't believe it. I actually didn't believe that. I don't know why, but I didn't. And now, now that I'm on the other side of it, I can say with certainty, that is true. We want you to succeed. We want you to do a good job. We want you to have fun. We want you to be yourself. We need you just as much as you need us. And um, and I know that's a very hard thing and much easier said than done. But I would say that relax, trust that we we really want you to to succeed and and do your best work. Shireen and then Karin, take us home. Um, yeah, like um, like Michael and Lucia, I'm also a performer and actor and. Um, member of SAG. 
And I think, you know, one of the most important things that I've learned uh, on from, you know, my experience on both sides of the camera is like, put your stamp on it. Like really have this, have a, come in with a strong point of view on your character and do not be afraid to make really bold choices. In fact, like really kind of make it your goal to just try something different. And in fact, I would also say to take it a little bit further, um, don't try to repeat something twice. You know, give give different takes, give different reactions, and um, and uh, you know, I mean, like Michael was saying, it's so easy to just get caught up in like the fear. Um, but if you know, I think if you're just really focused on being present and being uh, spontaneous, then you know, hopefully, there's no time to focus on that fear. Um, I, for me. First and foremost, uh, I really am a strong believer in coming to work, all of us very prepared. So I do hope for everyone showing up on set, knowing their lines. But beyond that, I actually feel like the most important thing that an actor brings to the job that that is 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 almost demanded of them more than anyone else is their total presentness in in their body, in the space and in the reality that they're living out. And so I like to just remind everyone on set that we need to make space for these actors to like feel the, the floor beneath their feet, to feel silence so that they can think and feel. And, and I like to remind the actors that we're holding that space for you and do everything you can to just stay tethered to your physical body, really. I mean, it's it sounds simple, but I I find it a challenge for myself. So I'm always trying to remind actors that I'm right there with them, trying to remain in my body and remain completely present as I'm making decisions and watching them make decisions. Well, I have loved all of this wisdom that all of you have dropped. Um, this has been so wonderful to have all of you in the same virtual meeting. Maybe one day we can actually do it in person uh, in 2025 or something. <laughs> uh, on behalf of SAG After Foundation, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom and your experiences with our audience and best of luck at the Emmys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, everybody.